started. Thank you everyone for being here today. Uh, I'm Elizabeth Donahue. I'm the Associate Dean here for Public and External Affairs and we're thrilled to have someone who really doesn't need an introduction for most of you in the room, Dan Kurtzer. Um, ambassador Kurtzer was the U.S. Ambassador to both Egypt and Israel and really is our Woodrow Wilson School in-house expert on all things Middle East. Um, it's a very turbulent time in the Middle East, as many of you know, and so we will touch on that. But really, we're also here to celebrate his um, publication of two books, which are both for sale outside, and he will sign. Um, faculty all write books, or many of them write books and articles, as you know. Very few put out two in one fall. <laughs> so um, we appreciate not only Ambassador Kurtzer's giving us his time, but we appreciate how prolific he is. Um, so there's a lot of things to talk about today, and I'm, uh, I'm so glad you're all here, and we'll get started. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, just a word on the books. Uh, they're a little bit like the Star Wars episodes. Uh, it, they're the second and third of three books on essentially the same subject, but they came out in the wrong order. Uh, the book that came out in 2008 it was really supposed to be the third of the trilogy and so forth. But uh, uh, together, taken together, uh, these books are designed to present both an analytical history, a diplomatic history of the Arab-Israeli conflict in the last 20 years, a uh, prospective set of policy ideas for how to move the peace process forward, and then a lessons learned for policymakers about what to do when they actually negotiate. Uh, so you don't have to read them in any particular order, but if you read them out of order, you may wonder why one came out first. Of course, Cornell University Press might answer that question even more astutely than I just did. Uh, I, I also want to note that uh, when Elizabeth and Patty decided to make this into an up to the minute, uh, there was probably a sense of optimism on their part that finally I might be able to say something optimistic about the Middle East if only we kept it up to the minute rather than broaden it in some historical context. And I'm, I'm sorry to disappoint. Uh, the uh, issues I, I do want to cover in my formal remarks are going to leave us uh, challenged with respect to our analysis of what's happening in this region uh, in three of the four issues. Uh, related to uh, Egypt, Syria, and Iran, uh, what we do have up to the minute is a perplexing set of uh, policies and actions which on the one hand uh, seem to be at odds with each other um, and contradictory therefore, but which actually I think represent a very serious tug of war within each of these uh, political uh, situations. In the fourth uh, of these issues, which is the Arab-Israeli, uh, we have none of those uh, perplex uh, uh, issues. Um, rather, we have failure of leadership and uh, what I might uh, uh, suggest is a, um, a rather weak uh, set of ideas that uh, seem to be motivating both leaders in the region uh, and here at home. And we'll discuss all of those in, in due course uh, in Egypt first, uh, the late Charles Isawi, who uh, many of you uh, remember, uh, the great uh, historian of Middle East economics, taught at uh, Columbia for many years and here for many years, uh, reminded us that revolutions revolve 360 degrees. And if we look at the Egyptian revolution from its onset uh, almost exactly two years ago, uh, we are not yet at the point where we can say it has revolved 360 degrees, but we can see a process unfolding in which this revolution is passing through a number of not unexpected phases. And the challenges which uh, confront the political leaders in Egypt uh, are in fact being handled in ways which, as I've remarked several times from this podium, are quite interesting when compared to the way other revolutions unfold. Uh, on the one hand, uh, the new president of Egypt, uh, Mohamed Morsi, has only been in office for six months. And until November 22nd, he displayed a sense or a 
uh, the ability of um, agility uh, that I think no one uh, quite expected, uh, both in terms of his handling of change in the leadership of the defense and military establishments, uh, almost a palace coup given the prominent role that the military has played in Egypt since 1952, since the revolution that overthrew the monarchy. And yet in one fell swoop, this newly installed uh, civilian president coming uh, even more dramatically from the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, basically replaced the defense minister, the chief of staff, and most senior members of the military establishment simply by fiat. And what it reflected was not only his political skill, but the fact that he had done his homework. Because we were to learn afterwards that while the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces, the military body that had been ruling the country on a temporary basis since the overthrow of Mubarak had been busy trying to figure out what to do. Morsi had been busy building personal alliances within the next tier down of military leaders. So that immediately upon becoming president, he reached into that next level and found a very willing group of up and coming military uh, officers who were quite happy to see the defense minister go and to see the chief of staff go and to see the path of upward mobility uh, open for them. Uh, that was just one example of what I would call this skill or uh, agility on the part of Morsi that really seemed uh, uh, almost quite out of character from what we had assumed we were going to get in a, a president from the Muslim Brotherhood. And yet on November 22nd, and in a series of decisions taken since then, including this week, Morsi has in some ways uh, begun to look like, of all people, Hosni Mubarak. Uh, because what Morsi did on November 22nd was to uh, basically assume temporarily, as he said, all powers, not just the executive powers of the presidency, which are rightfully his, and not just the legislative powers of a parliament which had been disbanded by fiat of the Supreme Constitutional Court, and which were at least legally his, but he also took himself out of the purview of judicial oversight. And therefore, in a sense, he was the single, potentially authoritarian ruler of Egypt. Not only that, but as the demonstrations grew after November 22nd, by what had been a fragmented and disunified opposition, Morsi began talking about uh, reinstituting emergency regulations, which were totally reminiscent of what Hosni Mubarak had done in the aftermath of Anwar Sadat's assassination in 1981. These were regulations ostensibly designed to ensure stability and law and order, and they did so for the next 30 plus years. Uh, what Morsi said is, I need to do the same thing. And he hasn't quite done it, but the actions of um, accruing this power and the predisposition to use uh, emergency legal provisions to uh, rule uh, extra legally, perhaps is the right word, uh, were quite reminiscent of the regime that was so abhorrent in the eyes of Morsi. Now, to be fair to him, the concerns that he had, which drove him to uh, take this decision on November 22nd, were actually reasonably well-founded. Because what Morsi was nervous about was the prospect that the Supreme Constitutional Court the same body that had uh, overturned the election of the parliament, you remember that was a parliament in which 75% uh, of its members were elected from both the Muslim Brotherhood and the Salafists, that Supreme Constitutional Court seemed ready to disband the constituent assembly that was drafting a new constitution. And Morsi believed 
still probably believes that the Supreme Constitutional Court is in fact a Mubarak carryover which embodies the counter-revolution. And you see in Egyptian editorials and uh, blogs and so forth over the past couple of weeks, this growing idea that the counter-revolution that everyone's been waiting for um, was averted as a result of Morsi's maneuver, which in effect took the issue of the drafting of the Constitution out of the hands of the Supreme Constitutional Court. Having done that, and with the 100-member Constitutional Drafting Committee having been narrowed down to 78 members when 22 liberals walked out, it was only a matter of another couple of weeks, in fact, a week ago Friday, that the Constitution uh, was completed and the draft was completed. And by law, Morsi was forced to declare a referendum within 15 days, which he did. The first round of the voting is supposed to take place tomorrow among expatriates, and the main round in Egypt is supposed to take place this Saturday. All of these events, in some ways, are legitimate when seen through Morsi's eyes. And they are totally illegitimate when seen through the eyes of the opposition. Not only because they're reminiscent of what Mubarak did and how he governed and how he ultimately uh, really just gave, uh, gave way uh, of all pretense of operating within a constitution, but also because uh, clearly both the crafting of and the substance of the Constitution were in many respects inimical to the interests of liberal and opposition parties. Paradoxically then, Morsi's actions, which he would justify, I think in the terms that I've just described, acted to both galvanize and begin to unify an opposition which had been totally disunified since the revolution. In fact, after the Tahrir uprising, which all of us watched with such interest, the uh, hundreds of thousands of people who were ready to come out and face down the security services and potentially the army, uh, after that event or set of events, the opposition simply fragmented. And even though you would see opposition elements uh, come out regularly to protest specific actions undertaken either by the military when it was uh, governing or by Morsi, uh, nothing worked as well as Morsi's actions since November 22nd to perhaps bring about a unified opposition, a, what they're trying to call a national salvation front. So you have here this set of perplexing and complex variables in which each side has something that's legitimate about its position, in which they're both headed towards what they think is the legitimization of this revolution, but which in fact uh, are not taking place on parallel paths, but perhaps on converging paths. And so in this Isawi model of a revolution that revolves or goes through phases, we may yet uh, be seeing the more violent or most violent phase of this revolution. In other words, uh, even the seven, or I think it's seven, who were killed in this last week and a half of demonstrations uh, may not be the end of uh, either violence or fatalities as a result of this a very challenging um, effort on the part of Egyptians to figure out how they want to govern themselves and to do so through essentially a constitutional process. What is, is there a wild card in this deck? Uh, there always is. Uh, potentially the military. Uh, when the uh, demonstrators uh, surrounded the presidential palace and began to uh, scale the fence, <clears throat> uh, President Morsi called out first to the presidential guard, which is part of the military, to protect the palace, and reports that he had asked the military to uh, secure key installations using Egyptian armor. Uh, it is not only unclear, but I would suggest unlikely that the military will do more to suppress demonstrators now than it did two years ago. And therefore Morsi 
will likely be very cautious in asking the military to do more when he can't be sure that they actually will uh, take action against uh, demonstrators. Uh, so the military is a wild card, but it may not be a wild card that can be played by Morsi. It may be a wild card that ends up being part of the hand that's played by the opposition. Last question, does the U.S. have a role to play? And while this is not a, a simple uh, question, uh, at least for the time being, it has a simple answer, and, and that is no. Uh, the United States uh, is not listened to in Egypt today. Uh, we still provide assistance. There are still threats of cutting off that assistance if the revolution or liberty, civil liberties and other kinds of rights and freedoms are abridged. Uh, but in the totality of this Egyptian revolution, uh, the role of the United States has been uh, minimized almost into non-existence. It doesn't mean that we're totally absent from the picture. As Halil Shikaki and I talked about just a couple of weeks ago in the context of the Gaza-Israel uh, war, uh, President Obama and Secretary Clinton did in fact play an important role uh, supporting the efforts of President Morsi to bring the fighting to an end. And Morsi recognized that uh, he could not have done this alone had the United States not weighed in behind him at critical moments. So it doesn't mean the United States is totally absent from the uh, configuration of uh, politics and diplomacy in this region, but in the context of this current constitutional struggle, uh, the United States has almost no influence to uh, affect uh, matters uh, in a, a direction that we would consider a positive. Let me switch gears and, and talk for a moment about Syria, another place where uh, events that seem to be driving in one direction are now driving in at least two other directions, and uh, whether or not those two other directions collide I think is uh, going to be uh, the up to the minute analysis that we're going to have to provide in the period ahead. Uh, the, the issue under debate in this country and elsewhere over the past months has been under what conditions uh, can or should uh, there be intervention in Syria uh, either for humanitarian reasons to stop the bloodshed and or for political reasons to accelerate the exit of Assad and the Assad regime. <laughs> And as this debate has unfolded, it has essentially uh, hit a number of dead ends, not the least of which is uh, a growing conviction that Syria is not Libya. In other words, it won't be so easy to use essentially Western air power uh, to make a difference in the battle. That Syria has assets at its disposal, which Libya also had, but perhaps because of the speed of the action in Libya, there didn't seem to be as acute a problem. And that, of course, is the issue of chemical weapons. And third, the uncertainty of whether or not, because air power might not provide the only answer in Syria, uh, was the West, i.e., is the United States ready to commit upwards of, name a number, 75,000, 100,000, perhaps 150,000 troops to fight yet another war in the Middle East. This was the direction of the debate within this country and elsewhere over the past months. Two interesting developments uh, over the past couple of weeks haven't changed the basic contours of this debate, but they have in fact intensified and sharpened some of the issues. Number one uh, is the question of chemical weapons. And you've seen in the newspaper the concern that uh, Assad may have, uh, in fact, uh, ordered the uh, arming of some of his uh, air force with chemical uh, weapons, at least uh, potentially uh, to be used. There's no evidence whatsoever to this moment that chemical weapons have been used, but uh, the United States and others, including Israel, <coughs> 
have been watching chemical weapons sites in Syria very, very closely. And the concern that you've been reading about in the press over the last two weeks reflects a concern within various intelligence communities that stuff is going on in the chemical weapons area. Uh, not exactly sure what it is, but enough stuff to be, um, to kind of begin ringing the bell and raising the red flag in, in capitals. Uh, and so this alone has intensified the debate, but there's been another development which paradoxically has now, um, in a sense, raise additional questions about whether we're asking the right questions. You recall over the past um, 18 months, there's been a persistent question, as there was in Iraq, about who should be the legitimate opposition. And could that legitimate opposition be crowned by the United States or by the West? Uh, in the Syrian case, as we heard from various speakers here in Princeton, uh, there were moments in which the opposition seemed to coalesce around uh, coalitions, uh, but those coalitions soon fell apart. Recently, uh, it seems that the opposition may be coalescing around exactly the people that we do not want to lead a coalition, and that is Islamists, particularly those with ties of some sort to Al-Qaeda, who are believed to have begun to mobilize or to unify the ranks of the opposition. So at the very moment when the debate in the West and the United States might be reaching the kind of crunch point because of chemical weapons where a decision could be in the offing, the people that you'd want to turn to as your opposition, as your unified opposition, are not the people you want to turn to. And there's great uncertainty now as to whether or not there is an opposition that we can um, unify uh, behind them and uh, to carry out an efficient uh, and effective uh, policy. We've seen also in the last uh, week reports that there may be softening in Russia's position, uh, yet to be seen. Uh, there certainly is a bit of an uptick in U.S.-Russian consultations on this matter. Uh, we haven't seen any evidence of the perceived softening, but all of this has to be thrown into this uh, big pot that's being stirred and stewed to see what it means. And right now, the uncertainties around our own policy with respect to Syria are mirrored only by the uncertainties on the ground in Syria itself. Third issue, Iran, which we've covered in quite some uh, detail over the past months uh, from this and other uh, podiums here in, in Princeton. One of the things that's, uh, that has to be looked at today, up to the minute, is what happens when uh, negotiations resume. And there's, there are a lot of indications to suggest that uh, there will be another round of negotiations uh, very shortly. Uh, there have been reports to suggest that the United States has for some time been trying to establish a bilateral channel with Iran, even as it negotiates in the context of the uh, five permanent members of the Security Council plus Germany, the so-called P5 plus one, uh, which has been a mechanism that has been effective in showing Iran a unified uh, uh, global position, but has been very detrimental to U.S. negotiating flexibility because of the need to coordinate positions with uh, five other countries who don't have a coordinated uh, set of interests or uh, positions. Uh, so that uh, the, the real question up to the minute then is, uh, will the United States, um, A, uh, find a bilateral channel uh, to talk in parallel with the Iranians, and B, uh, will it be able effectively to use that channel in a coordinated way with the P5 plus one to try to advance the larger agenda? Now, the immediate agenda, of course, remains to uh, bring about an end of the Iranian <coughs> nuclear weapons program. 
whether it's through an immediate suspension and long-term ending or some other negotiated outcome. But there's always been a feeling, and we've heard it uh, even here in Princeton and elsewhere, that the pursuit of that objective alone uh, can't work, that there isn't enough uh, negotiating um, uh, flexibility uh, within the positions of Iran or the United States to have an agreement that focuses only on the nuclear issue. And so, in a sense, uh, these parallel tracks, should they come about, may, in fact, give the United States the flexibility to play with other parts of our bilateral agenda with Iran in a way that are, is more difficult to do if we have to coordinate our policies and positions with um, uh, the other uh, five partners. So the Iran case up to the minute is uh, not very different from what it was up to the minute some weeks ago, other than the fact that we may be approaching uh, very soon another round of talks. And the one uh, issue to watch, I think, if we are able to see it from the outside, is whether, in fact, there, are, there is one channel of negotiations or two, uh, both a multilateral channel and a bilateral channel. Now, if these three uh, cases, Egypt, Syria, and Iran, have posed a series of complexities and, I don't know if there's a word perplexities, I guess there may be. <laughs> it rhymes, so we'll, we'll, we'll use it. The one that doesn't, the issue that doesn't pose that problem is the Arab-Israeli conflict. It is as it was, only worse. Uh, because what's happened since the last up to the minute discussion we've had? Well, the last time we met uh, was in the midst of the, the Gaza war. And the feeling was that that war would result in an outcome in which uh, both Israel and Hamas would be able to declare victory. Uh, Israel uh, saying that it had degraded considerably Hamas's uh, capability to launch rockets uh, and thereby uh, secured some level of deterrence, which in Israeli parlance means uh, the ability to persuade the other party not to do what you don't want them to do. Uh, and Hamas would declare victory because it would be standing at the end of this fight. And even though it would have lost a large part of its arsenal and a large number of people, uh, it would have gained politically from having confronted Israel. Uh, and in fact, uh, the ceasefire that emerged from Egyptian-led mediation resulted in pretty much that outcome. What was also forecast uh, quite accurately is that of all the parties who might associate themselves with these two victories, the one party who everybody would agree was the loser was the Palestinian Authority sitting on the sidelines. Palestinian Authority which cannot secure the release of prisoners because it doesn't engage in efforts to kidnap Israelis and use them as negotiating leverage. A Palestinian Authority which has consistently lost revenues as a result of the siege on Gaza, which has denied the Palestinian Authority the income that it previously had derived from legal trade coming into Gaza through Israeli ports. And a Palestinian Authority which has eschewed violence uh, now for seven years, but has seen its uh, negotiating position and its standing erode considerably. And so as a result of all this, and in fact, uh, I think there is consensus among analysts everywhere that in fact it was the Palestinian Authority as the kind of, uh, what's the name of that TV show, The Biggest Loser? Uh, that um, concretized the des decision by uh, President Mahmoud Abbas to take the issue to the United Nations and score a symbolic diplomatic victory. It was not a new issue, as we know. He had said he was going to do this in 2011 and was persuaded not to do so by the United States and others. But this time around, uh, there was no persuading him uh, to defer uh, taking this decision. The one argument that may have had some resonance, uh, had it been deployed effectively, would have been 
had the United States whispered in his ear, look, the president just got reelected. Fiscal cliff is coming. There's a few things to do at home. The Israelis have an election on January 22nd. Wait until February, and you will see, Mr. Abbas, that we're going to be serious. That might have had an impact on him, except there's no evidence that we said that to him. And instead, we uh, used our diplomatic uh, resources to try to lobby against uh, the vote in the UN, and uh, we lost big time. I think the 138 countries voted in favor, nine <clears throat> voted against. Uh, the only European country to vote against was the Czech Republic. Uh, most Europeans abstained. Um, so it was a, a, a very significant uh, uh, symbolic victory for Abbas and setback uh, for uh, the combined diplomacy of the United States and Israel. And what happened, which could also have been forecast, was that Israel took uh, uh, action in reaction to what they said was a unilateral Palestinian move. And they did two things. They announced that they were going to build 3,000 more housing units in several settlements, including uh, the resumption of planning for uh, housing in an area called E1, which is an area between Jerusalem and the settlement of Malay Adumim that effectively creates a contiguous corridor that would present a possible Palestinian state with tremendous dilemma of its own contiguity, since uh, that corridor would almost cut the West Bank in half. And secondly, the Israelis said, you know, the Palestinians have a bill owed to the Israeli electric company of more than $100 million. So rather than transfer the tax payments that we owe to the Palestinian Authority to the PA, we're simply going to use that money to pay the electric company. It is a legitimate bill, but what it does is put the Palestinian Authority into immediate crisis uh, because it can't pay its salaries and other more pressing bills. So in this complex of winners and losers, uh, the potential winner of the post-Gaza round, Abbas ends up losing again because uh, there are more settlements that are, uh, more houses and settlements that are likely to be built. E1 is now back on the agenda, although it's not an immediate issue, but it's back on the agenda. And the uh, financial crisis of the Palestinian Authority is very acute. The, before opening the floor then to your questions, I, the reason I suggested in this fourth category of issues, Arab-Israeli, that it's, there's nothing very complex about this, is that um, it isn't complex. Uh, the United States has a decision to make. Is this still an issue that's important to us? If it is, are we going to try to do something about it? Or are we going to do what uh, the analyst Peter Beinert suggested just yesterday, which is adopt a strategy of neglect? Uh, Beiner uh, made this argument that it, the neglect of the, or the perceived neglect of the Obama administration is not benign, but it's active. That it is driven by a view in Washington that says, no matter what we try, we get stymied. And since the Israelis and the Palestinians, but primarily the Israelis, are going to go their own way anyway, let them go their own way, and they're going to end up in such bad straits that they're going to have to come back to us at some point, and then there will be a need that will drive American action. Uh, I frankly don't believe that this is the strategy of the United States. I, I, I spent a few years in government, and we don't do strategies of benign neglect. Maybe sometimes we should. It might be beneficial sometimes not to do things. But um, I, I never saw during my years in government a strategy that said, well, let them stew in their own juice and then we'll come and you know, stir the pot later when, when the thing boils over. So I'm not sure that Beinert is right. But the, the external evidence that Beinert cites looks like he's right because the United States is not doing much.
Our response to the Israeli announcements was rather tepid. Uh, the Europeans are quite exercised by what the Israelis have done. The United States um, is not. And uh, there's no indication that um, the United States is gearing up for a serious action. Now, if we had this meeting next Tuesday, then rather than I standing up here, I would have my graduate students, because they are preparing an important report on whether or not there are alternatives to the two-state solution. And they're going to have a shot at talking to two senior policymakers from Washington who are coming to Princeton. So uh, in the next up to the minute report, maybe we'll get the graduate students to give it to you and let you know how well their ideas uh, suggested. In the meantime, though, um, on the Arab-Israeli front, um, same old, same old. Thank you very much. So as usual, I guess we'll do Q&A. And uh, precedence, of course, is usually given to students. Um, so if you want to line up here, and if there are no students, then uh, everyone else. And if there are no questions, we can go eat. <laughs> well, I have a question. I'm, I'm a little bit conflicted, and uh, I don't really understand the um, ability of the United States or Israel to negotiate with two separate entities, that is the Palestinian Authority and Hamas. Now that Hamas has gained significant political and public relations hype by virtue of their declared victory, how can you negotiate with these two entities? Well, in, in point of fact, Israel is not negotiating with Hamas. Uh, Israel's negotiating partner since 1993 has been the PLO. Uh, the PLO and Israel signed the Oslo Agreement and uh, those are the partners for negotiations. Israel and Hamas have had uh, various engagements, some military and some uh, diplomatic, but primarily surrounding the question of ceasefires, uh, whether or not uh, Hamas could guarantee uh, stopping rockets coming from Gaza, and if so, whether or not Israel would forego uh, targeted assassinations and other preemptive actions uh, which uh, uh, they are sometimes, uh, uh, which they sometimes take. So there's not a serious negotiation underway between Israel and Hamas at all, uh, and neither Israel nor Hamas sees this as anything beyond uh, ceasefire uh, talks. So uh, the the only question that uh, that I was addressing in my remarks is whether. Uh, the United States still sees it's in, in our own interest and whether Israel and the PLO see it in their own interest to resume a process of peacemaking involving those two parties. Uh, but so far, there's no evidence that that's the case. Yeah. Thank you. Um, two comments, please. First, in my very limited experience in Israel, I was uh, rather negatively impressed with the condescending attitude that many of the Israelis I met had towards uh, Arabs in general, Israeli Arabs, uh, Palestinian Arabs, and so on. It was sort of a Rodney Dangerfield kind of approach, but more importantly, it struck me uh, personally as my experiences in the South prior to 1964. Yeah, I'm, I'm supposed to tell you, by the way, that we invite questions, and so try, try to frame That's a question. The end of that question. Yeah. Right. Um, I don't know of any state that succeeded as having two parts, and I wonder whether there is any opportunity, um, any leverage for the U.S. and Israel to negotiate um, a uh, uh, disposal of uh, Gaza, that is to meld Gaza with an extended uh, East Bank state. Uh, in return for a very substantial Marshall Plan as a vehicle to increase economic capacity in Palestine? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, and in fact, the, the graduate students to whom I referred earlier uh, have been looking at various options, including a three-state option. In other words, a state in West Bank and a state in Gaza alongside Israel. 
or even a 2.5 state option, where Gaza is not quite a state, but it has some attributes of autonomy that allow that situation to stabilize while Israel and the PLO negotiate over the West Bank. Um, and I, I don't think you can rule out <clears throat> any of the possibilities, although um, there was no, in the, the discussions that uh, we had while uh, in the region a few weeks ago, there wasn't a lot of interest in a three-state solution. Gaza is a, a very challenging place to think about creating an independent state. You know, if we were real optimists, we'd say, well, Singapore is smaller. Um, Gaza is not Singapore, um, <laughs> and it's not likely to be Singapore for a while. So. Uh, what people really talk about is a stabilization plan for Gaza that might keep it kind of on a back burner or even in a freezer while um, the PLO tries to figure out a solution that will win the support of a majority of Palestinians in a referendum. So far, that formula hasn't worked, but that's the formula that I think people are more attuned to, at least going, going forward. Can you hear me? Um, kind of. Kind of. I'm this side. It's okay. I just was hoping that maybe we could go a little bit deeper into what you said a moment ago. If we, if we do believe that resolution of the conflict is a foreign policy interest of the United States, aside from feeling stymied, what possible reason would there be for the administration not to follow up boldly? Well, I, I've mentioned in previous uh, talks what I, I tend to call the Washington Consensus, and I put that in quotes. And you hear it from, um, I think, well-meaning people in Washington, but it's, it's really quite uh, distressing. You hear things like, well, it's, it's just too hard. Uh, we, we can't do it. Uh, and uh, the leaders in the region are not ready. And uh, the status quo is probably sustainable. And uh, if we fail again, uh, the likelihood of hurting American interests will be greater than previous failures. And, and, and. You have a, a succession of arguments that are marshaled that combine with the domestic agenda. I mean, you know, the reality is that however important the Middle East is to the president, uh, there are other competing American interests even in the Middle East, let alone outside the Middle East, and of course competing domestic interests, including uh, you know, what happens between now and the end of this year. So you, you put all those things together and you end up with this view in Washington which says, you know, don't bother me with this Middle East crisis. Uh, we have a little war, we'll fix the little war. The president did have to intervene and put out what a couple weeks ago I called the brush fire. And there are a lot of people who would prefer that the president uh, adopt that policy, become a uh, firefighter, rather than uh, commit the United States to an initiative which uh, they believe is bound to fail and hurt the United States worse. I, I, just in one word, I think it's totally misguided uh, in one of these two books, The Pathways to Peace, the one that looks forward, uh, there are, I was the editor of that book, there are 12 chapters and a preface co-authored by James Baker and Sandy Berger. All of those chapters say that is not sound policy for the United States. So, you know, there are people who want us to do nothing and there are a lot of people who want us to do something and that's where the policy debate really is, is taking place. Okay. Sir. Hi, I'd like to take advantage of you um, and that the line is not too long, so I'm gonna try and get three questions in. Whoa. If, that's, <laughs> that's if those long. are too many, yeah, just Juan, pick and choose. and then we'll come back to you. How about that? Um, you spoke about a number of very important uh, developments going on, but there are two countries that you didn't touch on. Uh, one is Turkey, which seems to be taking a more active role in the affairs of Middle Eastern countries than it had done under earlier administrations. And I'd like to hear your thoughts about that, if you'll share them. And 
Secondly, related to Turkey, it seems that they are ignoring American um, policy in part by trading rather heavily with Iran and going around the banking system by the, through the use of gold, which is the oldest monetary uh, vehicle for that. Um, and lastly, and I know you were just about to get there. You're going to get the three um, questions in. And I'm, uh, I'm just about to sit down, and that's Jordan and the role that Jordan is playing because it's affected both by the Syrian um, battling that's going on and the uh, Palestinian negotiations. Look, Turkey deserves its own uh, lengthy treatment. Um, what I would say literally on one foot is, yes, Turkey has very significant interests <laughs> and at times over the past couple of years has played those interests out rather deftly. Although in recent times, uh, Turkey has found that uh, it's not a neighborhood in which it's going to have no enemies. Uh, the policy of its foreign minister, which uh, Turkey thought would bring about um, a, a process of Turkey being the kind of uh, center of a wheel in which Turkish interests would reach out to Central Asia and the Middle East and the Mediterranean and up through the Balkans, it hasn't worked out that well. Uh, and other players with whom Turkey has not wanted to play, such as Israel, uh, have been able to stymie some of Turkey's moves. I mentioned a few weeks ago that uh, just when the Turks thought they had applied pressure on Israel with respect, for example, to exploration of gas in the Eastern Mediterranean, the Israelis reached over Turkey to reestablish very strong ties with Azerbaijan uh, or establish, I should say, strong ties with Azerbaijan, uh, Greece, and Cyprus, including reaching what looks like an agreement with Cyprus to delineate the continental shelf and the exclusive economic zone under the law of the sea treaty that removes any uh, justification that Turkey might have used to intervene in uh, gas exploration in that region. So it, was, it's not, it hasn't been so simple for the Turks as they've played this game out. And uh, in the most recent Gaza conflict, they were in fact largely marginalized. They came out solely uh, on the side of Hamas and uh, they were not useful to anyone as a, uh, a mediating partner. But I, I do think you know, it's, it's worth thinking about a Turkish, a Turkey uh, afternoon because it, it is a pivotal state and uh, uh, to think about uh, just Turkey without reference to a you know as an adjunct to the, to the Middle East. On Jordan uh, it also deserves uh, its own serious treatment although of the policy dilemmas facing the United States now Jordan has not risen to top rank largely because yes there's ferment and the uh, stability of the kingdom is uh, called further into question today than it has been in years, but I don't think anyone would assess that it's at a tipping point or close to a tipping point. Um, the issues in Jordan are somewhat similar to those in other Arab states. Uh, high youth unemployment, uh, unhappiness with uh, the slow pace of democratization, uh, but they also are very Jordanian in some respects. Uh, the East Bank establishment being quite unhappy with the prominence that the queen has given to Palestinians in the kingdom. And you have an additional factor in Jordan of the influx of refugees from Syria, which exacerbates the problem of the influx of refugees from Iraq on an already unstable situation. So it, yes, it's a very challenging environment, but um, you know, kind of on, when you have a, a top tier that's kind of boiling and the next tier is only approaching boiling, you let the next tier go for a while because you've got to do that top tier. Thank you. Okay, sir. Thanks for your time. I just had a quick question. Um, before, during your lecture, you mentioned uh, one of the issues in Syria that we're dealing, America is dealing with is the rise of a potentially anti-American regime. And that's an issue that America is facing since the 90s with an Algerian coup in the early 90s. And it may face it if, if Jordan continues to pose a threat. 
um, though it's unlikely, as you mentioned. Uh, so given all of this, I was wondering, uh, given what happened in Tunisia with the rise of an Islamic fundamentalist group that was then tempered by liberal forces within the country, is it really an issue if uh, what start off as anti-American <coughs> regimes come to power? Is that something America should be concerned about or, or more like no? Yeah, it's a good question because we're, we're at the early stages of the unfolding of events in Tunisia, also in Libya, where you have the same tensions at play. In Egypt, where those same tensions are at play, but for, uh, moving through democratic processes. So an argument can be made that, yes, in the short term, it may be the Islamists, even radical Islamists, who are more organized and therefore capable of uh, rising to prominence. But ultimately, they will you know, sink to a, a reasonable level as other forces come into play. And it's a fair argument to make. The, the concern, however, is the short-term concern. Uh, and in a, a society as unstable as Syria, uh, once you have removed that uh, coercive, stabilizing force of the Assad regime, um, will Islamists simply replace it with another coercive, stabilizing regime, which they run? And I think that's, that's the main concern. We don't know a lot about this, this uh, rising force in Syria. And uh, I think that's what's uh, also a cause for some concern. But I think the question is a good one. And it's one that you, know, you, you need to keep revisiting as you move forward. Because, the, for example, as you mentioned in Tunisia, you know, Anahda has not uh, become the dominant Islamist player. There are liberal forces that have uh, been a counterweight uh, in Egypt, as I mentioned, you now have the coalescing of an opposition that you know, may finally represent a, uh, a counter-political force to uh, the Brotherhood and to the Salafists. So it's just something to keep watching. My, my question is uh, fairly simple. Given the demographics of the Arab, in the Arab countries, their birth rate and the, uh, the demographics in Israel of the birth rate, what is the real motivation for Arabs to be the hostile entities to make peace with Israel when time and demographics are on their side? Well, the, the only motivation, if there is one, is that uh, time uh, can also work against them over time. Uh, Israel's power, the disparity of power between Israel and its neighbors has largely grown over these years at a time when you would have thought, because of population growth and uh, you know, other factors, uh, those power disparities may have narrowed. And I think the Arab uh, populations in the Middle East have come to recognize this, that the, uh, the, the sheer numbers that they present and even the, the demographic projections that uh, demographers will tell you about uh, don't offset the economic and uh, military power that Israel has been able uh, to marshal. So, you know, in that respect, I don't think that it's easy enough to say time is on the Arab side because they're going to outnumber Israel at some point. The numbers game here um, has not cut in favor of the uh, Arabs until now. And uh, it's hard to see why that would necessarily change in the, uh, in the immediate period ahead. Okay. Sir. Ambassador, uh, Israel has claimed that the Palestinian application to the United Nations violated the Oslo Accords. Is that a meritorious claim in your view? And if so, what should the proper response be of the United States and Israel? Yeah, the argument Israel made uh, was the, uh, the, what they called the unilateral nature of the application, that under Oslo, both sides were supposed to forego unilateral actions. And uh, whereas Oslo ultimately was supposed to result in uh, negotiations that would have led or should lead to a Palestinian state, by unilaterally going to the UN, uh, in a sense, uh, Palestine uh, violates it. I think it's a rather specious uh, argument. You can argue uh, against the application uh, because it doesn't gain much for the Palestinians. They will get a better seat in the General Assembly. They will have standing in specialized agencies uh, to do things that they were not able to do as observer. And the, the, the issue that's uh, of most immediate concern is they will also have standing in the International Criminal Court and the International Court of Justice uh, 
to uh, bring uh, what they perceive to be Israeli violations of international law to the attention of these courts. Uh, so those are real concerns. Uh, I, I don't think that the unilateral nature of the application itself was a, was a very meaningful uh, argument, uh, especially in view of Israeli settlements policies, which are uh, extraordinarily unilateral in nature. And uh, uh, by, uh, by the account of the entire international community, violate the Geneva Convention and the Hague Regulations. So, you know, I, I don't think that was the argument to rest on. I never, I never say if I were an Israeli policymaker, but if I were an Israeli policymaker, <laughs> uh, there were stronger arguments to make. I don't think they should have been made, but there could have been stronger arguments, which is have you now turned your back on diplomacy? in order to make this into a legal debate in the international legal system. And that's a serious issue. Mahmoud Abbas, in fact, raised this question in an, in an op-ed that he wrote a year and a half ago in the New York Times. And I, that's a serious issue. The unilateral nature of the move, I don't think, was serious at all. Uh, hi, thank you so much for your insight. Um, I just saw some news that uh, Britain held a meeting uh, a couple of weeks ago, including U.S. folks about. Um, I, I can't. I can't hear you. Can you hear me? Is this, yeah. Is it better now? Uh, just to be more on, up to the minute, uh, some news came out just now that um, there's plans on military intervention in Syria by the U.K. Um, naval and air forces, but it just came out now. Um, my question to you is regards to the Iranian nuclear program. Uh, you mentioned that um, the, aim, or the aim should not just be only on halting Iran's nuclear weapons program. Um, but the larger question in my mind is sort of we have had about 4,000 hours of IEA inspections in Iran, which has concluded there's no diversion of military activity. Um, the NIE, uh, NIE estimates have said that Iran has no active nuclear weapons program. So what, what is the um, sort of consensus that Iran is still pursuing a nuclear weapons uh, program when the, actually the evidence shows that it's not? Thank you. Well, actually, the evidence shows that it does. Uh, the IAEA, uh, as long ago as five or six years, uh, referred the issue to the UN Security Council under its own uh, provisions when it had reached the conclusion that there was a clandestine program underway that was beyond uh, its supervision. Now, at that time, you remember, the IAEA offered uh, Iran uh, access through the additional protocol, uh, which would have given the IAEA both um, more intrusive verifications and inspections and also surprise verification inspections. Iran accepted the additional protocol but never implemented it. So in effect, um, Iran went 10% of the way that the IAEA had asked them to go 100% of the way in order to dispel the IAEA's conclusion that there was and is a clandestine uh, nuclear program underway. What the American intelligence community said in 2007 was a, a very technical argument. Uh, they said that there was no evidence that Iran had resumed work on the weaponization of its nuclear program. Uh, now, weaponization is an important feature because if you have a nuclear device, you have to deliver it somehow. And uh, the weaponization part is marrying up that device to a delivery system. And the American intelligence community and the national intelligence estimate in January of 07 said that there was no evidence that Iran was continuing a weaponization program. The argument against that NIE, the national intelligence estimate, is that um, the challenge of weaponization today is not the challenge of weaponization of 1945. Uh, it doesn't take that long and it's not that hard to deliver a nuclear device, uh, especially in a, a context where we know Iran has long range missiles or at least medium range missiles and other delivery systems. Uh, not simple, but not as hard as it was. So the, the intelligence community was charged at that time with asking and answering a not so important question. Okay. The, the result of the 48 war was essentially an execution of the UN partition plan to provide a small Israel, essentially, smaller Israel as a home for the refugees from the Holocaust. And this is actually what president, the president indicated in the Cairo speech, I think it was 209, that was 
the purpose, the small of Israel. Now, after the 67 war, all the governments of Israel, probably a bit except of Rabin, were creating a greater Israel, a much greater Israel occupation, etc. We've got to get to the question part. The question is really that the United States and the rest of the world does not accept the greater Israel. My, I would like to see what is your opinion. What, are the gov what is the government of Israel and people of Israel that think about the future of Israel? Can it really exist in this, as a greater Israel? I, I'm not sure. Yeah, well, um, I didn't plant this question, but read chapter 12. That's your question. <laughs> read chapter 12 of Pathways to Peace, which is my chapter, and which tells you exactly what I believe, which is that there should be two states in the historic land of Palestine slash Eretz Yisrael. And in fact, there are policy prescriptions and an annex that provides parameters for settlement. So my answer is pretty straightforward. But I, I'll only give you that teaser. You actually have to read chapter 12. <laughs> Could you tell us what it is, in your opinion, that is holding Jordan together right now, and what it is that's keeping it at that level that's just below boiling and not quite boiling? And additionally, related to the question that you just answered, you can redirect me to your book if that would save time. Uh, do you think that there is any comparison to be made between South Africa in the 1980s, late 1980s, and uh, early 1990s, and Israel today? Look, on the first question, uh, I think Jordanians would point to the uh, continued legitimacy of the monarchy. You know, the Hashemite monarchy in Jordan is a relatively modern invention. It was imposed on the country after World War I as a result of British, French machinations uh, in the League of Nations. Um, but e even so, the monarchy has acquired a, a kind of legitimacy which uh, continues to bind the society together. The, the reason I mentioned the, the uh, issue earlier of this, uh, the East Bank complaint uh, that the Queen may be favoring uh, Palestinians is because that, in a sense, is one of the main demographic uh, conundra in the country. Uh, Palestinians probably outnumber East Bankers, and yet East Bankers have uh, still a dominant position in both the military security establishment and in uh, many of the government uh, uh, bureaucracies. Uh, so as long as the, there is this still legitimate monarch or monarchy sitting on top, that's, it's a glue that hasn't yet uh, uh, dried out. Will it at some point? You know, we, we just don't know. On the second question, I, I, I would refer not so much to the book, but to a speech that was given, um, I think it was two years ago or three years ago, by the Minister of Defense of the State of Israel, Ehud Barak. Um, and he gave it at the Herzliya Conference in January of two or three years ago, in which he said that Israel is not an apartheid state. And he cited all of the features of Israeli democracy and the protection of rights and so forth. But he said Israel could become an apartheid state if it maintains the distinction in the rights and legal obligations uh, with respect to those under occupation relative to uh, Israeli citizens inside Israel proper. And his argument, of course, was it, that's the reason you have a two-state solution. It's good for Israel. It's not just a, a favor that's being done to Palestinians, but you create a situation where Palestinians can achieve their right of self-determination, and Israel then returns to a size in which it can manage its own democracy. So it was he who talked about the possibility of Israel becoming an apartheid state, but it, it was a, a contingent issue that he raised if they don't resolve the issue with the Palestinians, and a uh, Palestinian state is not created. Okay. Sure. Um, I would like to know, um, in your opinion, uh, fairly, what does it stop the United States to take 
really a stand of a real, serious, and strong moderator. And what is your role? Because you, as a former ambassador, you seem to be an analyst, but not a fighter. So uh, there is no leadership. Oh, excuse yes, me. yes, yeah. that's the issue. I guess, I guess we are. Are we going to die with the same issues? Are we going to, to and the new generations to go through through this while you are just speaking about? That's my question. And then, then there that, are. That, that was what, a good enough question. Yes, right there. I, I have to be strong because because these issues and the weakness of the United States. Uh, it, uh, that it, there are consequences on the whole world, and including Eastern Europe, where this conflict has some repercussions that nobody talks about, but we have to take a stand. Sure. Uh, so uh, I, look, I agree with you, and, and uh, we need to know more of you, uh, uh, more, more okay. from you. I'll, I'll get to the answer now. Thank you. I, I, I agree with you, and um, as an analyst, I am fighting for a position which I want the United States to adopt. I want the United States to take a stronger role. Book number one, that actually is number three in the trilogy, uh, suggested ways in which we could improve how we negotiate in the Middle East. Book number one, which ended up being book number three, was a history of this conflict and why we need to understand it better. And book number two, which ended up being number two, uh, it tells you what we think should happen. So there is a struggle underway. I, earlier I referred to the so-called Washington Consensus. There are many of us who are fighting against that consensus. So what stops the United States? What, really? Well, what stops us now is the hour. So uh, thank you very much. <laughs>